I'm a professor in Earth System Science. Uh -huh. Where is that? At the University of Exeter. Okay. And are we alone in the universe? Uh, as complex thinking beings, we might be very rare in the universe. Are we alone? Possibly. How about the life on Earth? Is the life on Earth alone in the universe? No, there's, I suspect, a massive amount of uh, life in the universe, but it would be what we might call simpler forms. And do you, think that it, do you think it's inevitable that simpler forms evolve into what you would call, would you say, complex forms? Um, complex self-aware life forms, at least in the case of the Earth, it was spectacularly difficult to get as far as us. And that's why I think that, that complex life or certainly self-aware life is, is pretty rare in the universe. You said far. Is it one-dimensional? The problem of m making complex thinking, self-reflecting beings, um, it, the problem is that you have to go through a series of profoundly difficult transitions, not just in the evolution of life, but in the whole transformation of the planet and the biosphere um, that includes ultimately those beings. And each of those revolutionary events could be so improbable that it only happens in one in, who knows, a million or a billion cases. And if you have to string three of those rare events together or four to get to something like us, then that's why we're rare in the universe. If I gave you a hundred billion dollars with the caveat you have to spend this money to help answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? Wow, I, a hundred billion. A hundred billion, lots of, oh, even more. <laughs> um, well, I'd certainly um, accelerate the efforts to try and detect signatures of life on so-called exoplanets around other stars. I'd go after probably um, the different stars to the ones that are currently being targeted. I'd go after things more like the sun, slightly rarer, brighter G, G stars, for some reasons I could discuss, because I think those, that high energy starlight has been helpful in allowing photosynthesis to evolve, the kind of photosynthesis that splits water and creates oxygen, which is necessary for us complex beings. So that, that would burn up quite a bit of the money. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned by investing in better understanding the history of life on our planet, so I'd spend some of it there. And I, I guess I would really make an effort to get to the bottom of whether there's ever been life on any other body in our solar system. So there's several candidates, Mars, possibly early Venus, and some of the, some of the satellites of the gas giants. Well, what do we know about how life got started on this planet? Uh, we just know, well, we know that it started remarkably quickly in the sense that, well, we're fairly confident it was definitely here within 50 million years of the end of the so-called late heavy bombardment, which might have been not, which is Earth getting pummeled by, and the Moon, and the inner solar system getting pummeled by large rocks, uh, which ends about 3.9 billion years ago, and those rocks probably would have evaporated large parts of the early ocean. As soon as that's over, you know, in a geological blink of an eye, we've got sedimentary rocks with evidence of life in them, albeit chemical evidence. And now there's suggestions for evidence of life before the bombardment. So all of that is adding up to say, starting life is not that difficult in the one, in the sample size of one that we know of. Oh, have you ever seen a UFO? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you have a favorite science fiction movie? With uh, aliens in it? Uh, yeah, District 9, District which Nine. is, of course, because it's not about aliens, it's about, <laughs> it, it, well, it is about aliens, but it's really about apartheid in South Africa. So, so if, I asked, if I asked your emotional side, you have an emotional side and a rational side, I guess, if I asked your emotional side, what kind of aliens would you like to find in the universe? <laughs> oh, I'd be perfectly happy finding microbial aliens, um, because I know that microbes are running this planet still for the large part and so we owe them a great debt here even though it's they're massively undervalued by us humans uh, but I'd, I'd be equally delighted to find them elsewhere because I think they're the most important organisms in many ways because they run biospheres including this one. I think uh, 
Arthur C. Clarke said something like, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic. And then I read that there's a, some guy named Carl Schroeder who said, no, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. And if that's the case, then I suppose that SETI would have a harder job because advanced civilizations will be tree-hugging and technologically quiet. What do you think of that? Well, I think there's some merit in reflecting on the thought that um, if technological civilizations are to persist, including our own, they have to, they have to become a constructive part of the, the Gaia or the Earth system or the planetary system that they're a part. They certainly have to become a less destructive part than we are. In other words, they have to achieve a kind of level of material cycling and sourcing of starlight or free energy that we have yet to achieve. And so they're operating a much more like a microbial biosphere, at least in a material and energetic sense, unless they crack nuclear fusion. And even then, they've got to do massive material cycling. So their footprint on their own planet has to soften compared to the one we're having on ours. Um, I guess that doesn't preclude, you know, fancy remote forms of distant communication, etc. But I think those are the only kind of technological civilizations that would have a long enough lifetime to be the, the, the most frequent kind you'd find out there in the galaxy or the universe. Uh, so speaking of life out there in the universe, uh, there's something known as a Fermi paradox. Do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? Uh, no, but following on from what I just said, I'm sympathetic to the view that, um, that based on this sample size of one, uh, advanced technological civilizations might blow themselves out pretty quickly because they can't strike the right relationship with their host planet and resource base. <laughs> and they, so so self-destruction is your favorite solution? Uh, I wouldn't say it was a favorite because <laughs> on a moral and ethical level it's, it's, it's uncomfortable but, uh, but it would and we should always be careful to uh, extrapolate from our sample size of one but um, for some reasons that we might tie back to, to natural selection, to evolutionary principles, you can understand why we're proliferating rapidly and consuming more and more energy and technologies now subject to forms of selection that are, and that's all a process that's clearly accelerating. But that's a risky path to go on. For me, it's like another, for, the, for me and for the Earth, it's like another of these revolutionary moments that are very rare in its history, where things can go spectacularly wrong and the biosphere could kill itself off, or we might scrape through. But it's certainly, it's certainly a risky place to be, and it might be part of the answer to Fermi's paradox. Would you agree with Nick Bostrom when he said that if we found extant life on Mars, it would be the worst news ever? <laughs> And the, the logic is that <laughs> if, if we find life on Mars independently origin, then life fo forms everywhere, and yet we see no technological civilizations. Therefore, once you become technological, you kill yourself. In other words, self-destruct, that's evidence for self-destruction as a, as a generic result of life. I can follow that logic, but I would argue that there are several, what I call critical steps in the sense of Brandon Carter or my friend Andy Watson, on, in between um, but the beginnings of life and advanced technological civilization. So there are these very rare and difficult evolutionary events that have to be pulled off. One of them is the origin of water splitting photosynthesis. It took at least, it took around a billion years on the Earth. And the other is still poorly understood, but it's something difficult in the development of uh, more, more complex multicellular uh, life forms. And all of that has got, those two at least have got to happen before you can worry about making um, conscious or self-aware creatures like you or I. So yeah, if we find simple life on Mars, I wouldn't be completely shocked. And it, for me, it could still mean that, you know, there are two or three more difficult steps after that that are very rare. Um, before you get to things you could detect by SETI. And it could, the difficulty doesn't have to be in, in the fact that civilizations blow themselves out. It could be it is you know, spectacularly difficult to create an oxygen-rich atmosphere, for example. <laughs> hmm. Now, in astrobiology, we often say, we're trying to guess at what kind of life is elsewhere. And one way to guess is to say, well, what has happened on Earth 
What type of features do we have that have evolved independently of each other? And if something has evolved independently more mm -hmm. than once on Earth, that becomes a better candidate for what we should, ex we should expect that elsewhere. Uh -huh. Do you agree with that logic? Interesting logic. Um, it's something that Simon Conway Morris has, uh, I mean, he's yeah, of course, convergence. His convergence ideas. Well, I mean, it's, I think it's fair to infer that if there are multiple independent origins of certain traits, whatever you want to call them, on the Earth, then they're relatively easy to evolve in the grander scheme of things. So if evolution is happening elsewhere, we could expect them to happen. So in that vein, crude forms of multicellularity aren't difficult, but there's clearly only w one origin for um, water splitting, so-called oxygenic photosynthesis. And it's in a bizarre side branch of the prokaryotes very late on. So that's why I would give that as you know, one candidate of a very difficult evolutionary event. Well, how do you sell, I, I trip over the word independent origin because all life has a common origin and therefore ah, it's not yeah. really independent in any fundamental Sorry. sense. Yeah. I mean, that's, so I've been pushing back on this idea. I, I'm a kind of a deep homologist. Kind of yeah, thing. yeah. He talks about independent origin, 20 independent uh, origins of eyeballs. And I said, well, wait a minute. Look at the biochemistry of the eyeballs. And I like your thinking, Charlie. So I, c I could sympathize with that, that, that you know, um, maybe multicellularity pops up many times in the tree of life because the same core recipe for it is, is carried Certainly, you could argue it might be carried in the whole eukaryote clade, for example. And of mm. course, there are some prokaryotes with primitive multicellularity, make one or two different cell types. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting line of reasoning, that there are some deep, some deep organizational principles that, that, that this, this uh, lineage of life on the Earth is, is all carrying. Well, how about the, we have plants and animals and fungi among multicellular eukaryotes. Mm. Do you think we should expect animals elsewhere on other planets or plants oh. or fungi? Or is that tripartite division anything that would qualify as a fundamental aspect of evolution that we might be universal? Good question. I think animals are difficult and particularly difficult because of, with the exception of sponges, the basal animals, you've got apoptosis, you've got programmed cell death, you've got an ex I think of an animal, most animals, as an extraordinary form of altruism in the sense that all of our cells, except for the stem cells, have given up the possibility of, of living independently and to have stabilised in an evolutionary sense that altruistic collective that is you or I or pretty much any other animal requires some pretty extraordinary conditions and we're not quite sure what they were but clearly it happened. But that's not just animals, plants, it's also plants and the no, fungi. Not to, no? Well, I wouldn't say that the degree of terminal differentiation is as extreme in, say, a plant. Um, I'd use a sort of trite example that you can propagate uh, cuttings from plants in a way you can't propagate advanced animals. <laughs> um, so there isn't quite the same level of, of terminal cell differentiation, although admittedly it's also a pretty, pretty advanced uh, complex collective. But would you expect the three-way split? I'm not enough of a biologist to give a better answer than I've probably already given, but it, it seems to me that, um, that the plant, that, well, it seems to me there are many puzzles because, after all, the land plants come after the animals on the earth. And mm -hmm. So I think we, frankly, I'm going to plead ignorance and say that we're still trying to understand, even for the earth narrative, why things happened in the order they did and what, what were the constraining or, or possibly controlling factors. Okay, now your name is associated with the Gaia hypothesis. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> The Gaia hypothesis is, uh, is the postulate that Earth and the non-living parts of our planet form a self-regulating system that maintains broadly habitable conditions for life. Um, I've become the kind of younger champion of the idea that originates with Jim Lovelock and Lynn Margul the late Lynn Margulis. Um, that's, for me, perhaps the boldest and most exciting hypothesis about how our planet functions and, and why we're here in, in some sense. 
it's had much, much resistance in the scientific community from many quarters, particularly evolutionary thinkers who make some rightful objections to, theoretically, to how on earth could such a, a thing have come about. And some of us, myself included, are still trying to work on understanding how, how can self-regulation at the planetary scale um, emerge in some statistically s somewhat probable sense when you have life evolving on a planet. And we've got some answers, but I don't think we've got the whole theory. <laughs> I read a, a chapter in a book called Water Gaia by Harding yeah. mm -hmm. and Margulis about 10, 15 years ago. And the idea, I guess, was that life does what, life somehow not only regulates the temperature, but possibly tries to keep water at the surface. And it's kind of like our skin tries to keep water, you know, yeah. from evaporating. Now, what do you think of that idea and how, what is any details involved that you know anything about? I'm not, <clears throat> I... I've not looked into that one too closely, but I think it remains an interesting question. There's a whole ra range of interesting questions around why does Earth have the amount of water it has and how has it kept hold of it? Um, for example, could it have lost a large fraction of the water it has um, through hydrogen escape to space if the thermal structure of the atmosphere had been different, if, if the composition of the atmosphere over time had been different? let alone discussing the interaction of surface water back with the mantle and the upper crust once you have plate tectonics. So I think it's a great, a great area to work on. I, don't, I think we, whether it's down to life or some mixture of life, I suspect certainly some mixture of life and plate tectonics to understand how the Earth's surface water balance is regulated, I, I think it's cool. Personally, I think the thing that gets neglected when we talk about the Gaia hypothesis is we kind of fixate with could life have helped maintain um, a habitable climate or temperature, but we forget that what life has done in a stunning way is, is develop these extraordinary recycling systems for all the elements and compounds, all the materials it needs at the surface of the Earth. And that is, in a sense, promoting the fecundity of the biosphere by orders of magnitude. Uh, you know, if you ran a biosphere just off what was coming in through volcanoes and hydrothermal vents, it would be chronically, you know, f tiny fraction of the productivity we see today. So the biosphere, in some sense, bootstraps itself into this extraordinary high productivity state by recycling all the materials it needs. And I think we can understand how that's come about and that it might be quite robust and is the most, in a sense, powerful facet of, of this Gaia, I think, along with playing some role, it's certainly in regulating the climate as well, and who knows about the water. <laughs> right. Um, how about, have you seen the movie Contact? No. No, okay. I in don't the, watch enough movies, You don't watch enough. In the movie, many, it, you know, it was based on Carl children. Sagan's book, Contact, uh -huh. and uh, in the movie they say a couple times, uh, are we alone? And the answer was, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. What is your reaction to that statement? <laughs> oh, that's kind of cute. Um, well, I'm, I'm not religiously inclined, so I think it could be any which way, the universe, you know. We could be um, extra the, ex the almost extraordinary anomaly. As I've said, I, I think there's a lot of life around, it just might not be the kind of life we can talk to or communicate with. Um, I don't think it would be a waste of space if, if we were rare or, or life was rare. I think what the response we should have to that is not, not that it's a waste of space, but rather the rarer we are, the more we should cherish this extraordinary biosphere and the more we should seek not to uh, degrade and destroy it through our collective actions. I, uh, I think Carl Sagan also used to say that we are the way in which the universe is becoming self-aware. Yeah, he did. What do you think of that? <laughs> I think that's a that's that's an that's a nice a nice aphorism that I sometimes repeat to my students when I and I sometimes also give them some of Carl's pale blue dot speech uh, when I'm teaching them about Earth history. And it, of course, that particular remark speaks to a, a particular tradition with Teilhard de Chardin and others who talk, like Vernadsky, who talked about the new sphere, the sphere of consciousness or self-awareness. The way I try to take this idea is, 
if we're going to get out of the hole we're digging ourselves now as a technical civilization, degre degrading our planet, is going to be to achieve what I'd call some kind of self-aware feedback or teleological feedback, where we are collectively aware of the consequences of our action for this planet, this Gaia, and we adjust our actions accordingly so that we have become part of the self-regulation system. But now, instead of it being unconscious and automatic, it's got this self-awareness or teleology built into it. So we are the way in which the universe is becoming aware of itself and the way, certainly the way this planet is becoming aware of itself. And if we're going to get through this century and the coming centuries, we're going to have to take that awareness and kind of make it part of the planetary machinery. In, in several of the things you said, you said, for example, whether life elsewhere could get that far. Mm -hmm. And you usually divide potentially, our, your understanding of life elsewhere would be either simple microbes or more complex things like us. Now, it, are there an infinite ways of getting complex or an infinite ways of, is there a, an, a, the space of possibility is so large that it would be inappropriate to talk about this distance narrative, a distance metaphor to get so far? And it, I was wondering it, about interesting, that. Interesting, interesting thought. Yeah, because you I, seem I'm to think of there's a filter or bottlenecks and I'm as glad, if it's a train I'm glad, going you, to I'm glad you're pressing me because I think, I think as I tried to say before, I think there, that on, at least in the Earth case, we can identify a few of these critical steps. Well, steps, uh, when you and say the word steps, you're going somewhere. In between that, the steps, you could identify some stages of life. And one would be kind of prokaryotic uh, biosphere. One in the middle would be a kind of simple eukaryotic biosphere. Right. So one would be a kind of um, animal, alien, multicellular, complex eukaryotic biosphere, and another would be a technological civilization. Right. So what you're listing here is, is something like the major transitions in life, but in it seems to me. System, yeah. But but I, let me push back on that a little yeah, bit because yeah. if there's a tree of life and all of the wonderful things around us, there's an E. coli over yeah, here, there's yeah. a fungi over here. Every one of those branches. Along them, there are major transitions. Sure. And you've just listed the major transitions that we share with a lot of other creatures, and then we go off in our own direction, sure. and then you list the major transitions so, of us, not of life. And so I'm a little I bit... I think that's a very fair comment, and I, would, I should probably push back and be more Catholic in my enthusiasm for all forms of life, because as I said earlier, I think I cherish all kinds of life forms, from especially the microbial. The reason I went with that narrative is possibly because sometimes what we're trying to rationalize is, is our own existence as self-aware creatures. And that's why the narrative then gets skewed to, as you say, to these stages on the way to us, which gets rather Christian or uh, quasi-religious in its qualities. So. I don't think yeah. there's anything wrong with it as long as you recognize that, oh, I'm trying to understand my own history, not life. Precisely. And that's, I, I, what that's where we're absolutely agreeing is because the, pu the way the puzzle's framed in that case is um, how is a self-aware creature come to be that can look back on the history of its planet and of life and marvel at it? And of course, one explanation for that appeals to this weak, so-called weak anthropic principle that, that the Earth has to have a history that's consistent with our existence as, as observers and, and that's biased us to see this particular kind of history. So if we opened our mind a little wider and we weren't constrained by that, then we could imagine all manner of ways in which life could develop, many of which might not end in self-awareness and who cares after all that's not the be all and end all if we could uh, if you could uh if you're in control let's try to rewind the tape of life yeah. not as stephen jay gould did only to the cambrian let's go back to the formation of the sun and we're going to form the earth again now what do you think would be similar in terms of life on this new rerun earth and what would be different there, can you divide the properties of life into something that is more deterministic and high, more highly probable and other things that are less so probable? So that's a great question, Charlie, and that's sort of what I've been trying to do with, some, with various members of my research group is run experiments in silico in, in, in the computer, seed artificial planets with artificial life forms and ask what are, what are probable outcomes. I think one of the probable outcomes is that if life can get an initial foothold, if it can solve whatever initial 
regulation problem it's posed, let's say. Well, first of all, you use the word life. Now, yeah, sure. <laughs> what about that? There's some ambiguity associated with that as well, right? You mean whether we're talking about carbon-based life or, or well, just whether life should start or not start? Or whether, the, what is life? I mean, what is a hurricane? I, for example, I've written articles saying, hey, hurricanes are alive or convection oh, cells okay. are alive, far from equilibrium dissipative systems. And then, well. Um, I have to, um, okay, I'm gonna disagree there. Good, good, go ahead. So I, uh, although I'm, I'm gonna get in trouble if you, uh, like every scientist does, if you ask them to, to define what is life, but, um, Hurricanes and convection cells don't 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 have an information carrier within them that can get copied and passed on to subsequent generations of hurricanes or convection cells. So I think that informational uh, content of life, as well as its low entropy and ordered state, is absolutely crucial. How about stars? Are they life forms? No. Nope. Be, well, they have information on their outside. Their, their chem okay, their so fair enough. Information can, take, information can take many forms, so maybe I'm going to get It can be into global, it can be local, and it can yeah, be in, yeah. in, interior. Internal. But I, for some reason, I'm, I'm liking the... I think also this would over-narrow it, but... Yeah, but I'm liking the idea of information carrying... Does it have to be molecules in some sense, but... Not well, necessarily, we're, but... Well, we're in the process of externalizing our information from the are. genes, right? But, yeah. okay, there it is. G -g 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 okay, let's use that. And that's all in silico, and so... Agreed, agreed. So <laughs> I want to go back and answer an easier question. Okay. I was, uh, but uh, So I'm going with a, an as-yet unfully formulated uh, d definition of self-replicating uh, well, living entities. And I'm more... Because basically, I, bizarrely, I'm not... I shouldn't say this at this meeting, but I'm not that interested in the problem of the origin of life because I think it's partly or largely philosophical and not very amenable to um, empirical testing and falsification. So I'm more interested in what once life has started, given that it started pretty easily on the Earth, as you said, if you replayed the type, tape, what would happen next? Would life blow itself out catastrophically or would you in most get cases? Life in the, or is, is yeah, there, so are there so many different kinds of life that what yeah. we mean by life could be just some so tiny thing? So I think you would get carbon, some kind of carbon-based uh, life uh, fairly easily. I'm not sure whether it's at all easy for it to have the kind of RNA to DNA evolution. That could be spectacularly, the RNA to DNA step could be a spectacular difficult one that just happened to happen. Well, why do you think it's on, uh, likely to have carbon water-based life then? What, what makes you think that? Oh, it's probably just the, the inevitable problem of the prejudice of what we're familiar with, isn't it? But so you're I, just repeating I, your own prejudices. I, I think it's because, well, I, I guess um, from, a, from a chemical point of view, at least the kind of um, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, oxygen, hydrogen-based life we see, um, the chemistry has a certain beauty and logic to it that you've got kind of, you make clever use of the elements and the chemistry they have for your energy carriers, for your structural backbone, etc. I'm not saying it couldn't, we couldn't imagine configuring things some other way, but this is a, from a chemist's perspective, this is a pretty, I was almost going to say logical, <laughs> um, way of using the, the, the qualities of the chemistry you're gifted, and I think that's universal. But yeah, you're right. There, I'm, not, I'm open to the possibility that there are, there are other forms, other kinds and forms of life. So, and I'm equally kind of narrow-minded that I'm happy to just entertain thoughts about once we get some carbon-based life on the planet, what path could it, could it take? Because that still opens up a whole plethora of possibilities. Well, one of your English colleagues, uh, Simon Cunningham and Morris, would say, oh yes, you'd get humanoids again. And are, I don't you... believe that, yeah. So I'm obviously willing to draw the line somewhere. But I reckon even, actually, to be honest, in the modeling that we do in my group, we, don't, we can be so abstract in how we handle the chemistry that, that, you wouldn't, that it isn't necessarily carbon-based. We just have a chemical based life that is got to do that's got to build its bodies whatever that means out of some materials let's call them chemicals and whatever those chemicals are they some of them 
are, are likely to be in short supply with modest inputs from the interior of the planet they're living on and therefore they're going to have to solve a recycling problem f to get the materials to build their bodies otherwise they're going to be chronically limited and what we find in our kind of artificial life simulations is solving the recycling problem is fairly robustly done it might take some time but it's stable once you've solved it so the harder problem is how can a biosphere get to regulate its let's call it climate or some globally well mixed properties of the atmosphere or whatever we have some models and some mechanisms some selection mechanisms by which that can occur but uh, we're still working on that I think that's that's understanding how that can come about and you use, you use the word recycling problem, and, uh, and as if it was a problem for life. I've always done it the opposite, and I've said uh, there are gradients, and life is the solution to the, to the recycling problem. Yeah, and I think I'm sort of agreeing with you in the sense when I say that recycling emerges as a pretty robust property of these uh, biospheres in silico. They're good at solving that problem and I think that's partly for partly for the reason you said which is um, where there's where there's something built where there's something building up in the environment that something could make some living thing could make use of it it, it it will and there are free energy and other gradients that will be exploited and so we just need a certain heterogeneity of free energy and redox conditions to uh, support a re chemical recycling system but life is as we know you know ca great has a bunch of great catalysts in it so the catalytic qualities of life mean you can spin these potential recycling loops around uh, at, extra at extraordinary speeds if you like. <laughs> well you use the word exploited and life exploiting a gradient I thought uh, see, I, I, enjoying my, a gradient in my head it's just the opposite that the gradient is the active agent and, ah. it, and the life form is what it creates to undo itself this is the second law of ben, uh, thermodynamics oh blimey so I, I always take life out of the active role and put it oh life was created as the solution to the undo the gradient oh wow and that's how now I understand how we see the world or the universe in different ways because yeah. I I'm obviously um, putting a lot of emphasis on, on life as a process and giving it a lot of agency in my right, right. reasoning. I think it's a process, but it's not, I, don't, I take so away I, all agency. I think, I think I'm giving life a lot more agency in my reasoning, and I'm, yes. uh, and I'm, co I'm cool with doing that, but yes. having this conversation will uh, you know, make me <laughs> reflect on uh, whether I've got some kind of something that I haven't even recognized some quasi-religious streak lurking in my subconscious. Oh, we all do, don't we? As a matter of <laughs> fact, some, pe some people have to <laughs> believe that the SETI is a... When I ask people what do they w want to find, they often find, oh, I want to find some uh, omniscient, uh, ubiquitous <laughs> thing that's going to solve all my problems. That, well, you're looking for God or something. What do you think of accusing SETI <laughs> researchers of looking for God? <laughs> Well, I, th I don't know if they're looking for God, but I think they're looking for someone to talk to, which perhaps suggests a certain, we're all feeling a certain cosmic loneliness. I, I just don't feel that drive. I can't perhaps easily explain why, but I'm not feeling in the least bit compelled to go out and find if there are other aliens, let alone ones I can talk to. I am fascinated by, I'm absolutely fascinated by the search for life elsewhere in the near galaxy or universe if you like mm -hmm. but I'm not in the least bit bothered about whether I can chat to it or not I'm actually I'll be as excited if it's microbial mm -hmm. as, as if it's conscious so are we alone in the universe uh, n not in the sense of being the only living things for, for sure uh, or not in the sense of being the only bi on the only biosphere. So you're, you're pretty convinced that there's life elsewhere in the universe? Yeah. 